preparing to live stream the meeting. Stream the meeting. We are live. All right. Oh, Brian. Are we live? We are live. Okay. Brian, I'm still trying to admit here. Um, we're live on YouTube. All right. Maybe someone's watching. We'll see. Um, all right. I guess we'll get started. Where, where do you? Sorry, go ahead. No. Where do I find the live feed? Is it under home videos, playlists, channels? Do you know? Um, if you go to your. Uh, 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 I'm logged in, so it's just Pikes Peak. It's uh, under my channel, and it's just the home page, and it's currently live. So okay. I'm not sure. Will you send? Will you copy the link and send it to me in the chat or somewhere? Sorry, everybody's probably laughing at us if they can hear us. Is everyone watching right now? <laughs> Is anyone? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, okay, the link's not working again, I guess. Okay, um, <laughs> okay. I'm going to chat it to you. Can you post this one? Yeah, in Zoom or in. I'm going to chat WhatsApp. it in Zoom and then you okay. can. That should work, hopefully. Okay. Um, just uh, oh, on YouTube. Okay, little technical difficulties to start the day. That's okay. This should work. Okay. All right. It looks like Brian's unable to join. This is what, who we've got. So let's go ahead and get started. I don't see anyone in chat yet. So I'm going to just type in. Um, okay. All right, let's get started. Hey, Brian. Brian's here. You're muted. We can't hear you. You should be able to unmute him from your end if he can't figure oh, it out. Brian is connecting. Brian Yay. did not connect. Brian did not connect. Brian has connected three times, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me, which one's Brian here? Brian, it says you're unmuted, so I don't know what's up. Oh, it's oh Brian. There there, I've got audio. Okay. All right. Brian's here. Can you see right. this? I can see the top of your head. Oh. <laughs> now I can see the trees. Okay, welcome, Brian. We're going to get hey, started Brian. now. Look at that okay. rain cloud. Woohoo. All right. Lovely. Welcome. Everyone, all you mushroom lovers out there, hopefully someone's watching. <laughs> we had some technical <laughs> difficulties getting started today, but here we are at the May meeting of the Pikes Peak Mycological Society. Um, yeah, yeah, there, there's our logo. Uh, so um, we have a couple board members, officers with us today. So I'll just go down the list and introduce everybody. Um, so I'm Ben Kinsley, I'm the president of Pikes Peak Mycological Society. And uh, Jennifer Bell's our vice president. She's not unable to be here today. Beth Leak is our treasurer. She's also unable to be here today. Alyssa Hartson, secretary and webmaster. Alyssa. I am here today. Hi, everyone. Excellent. Brian uh, Barsby, board member at large, long time, ex president, everything, uh, part <laughs> of the club. Hi, everybody. Uh, we got Jessica Langley, newsletter co-editor. We're using her Zoom account. So when I talk, it says Jessica Langley there. Um, <laughs> and then Mercedes Whitman, newsletter co-editor and our guest speaker today. Hello. All right, awesome. So um, we have a couple announcements before we turn it over to Mercedes. And I just wanted to uh, first say that we've been paying attention to weather. We've been looking uh, for mushrooms, 
trying to figure out how and when we might be able to do a foray, how being very important, but also when being very important. Uh, Brian, you and Jennifer went out today. What's the, what's the moisture report? We went up pretty high. It's very moist. Um, and we got chased out by sprinkles. So that's a good sign. Um, of course, it's real early and we didn't see anything really fresh going on just last year's dried mushrooms but we're at the moment yeah okay. it's good uh there's some hint and maybe a call if it rains tonight and tomorrow that um maybe we'll go down to levita next week tuesday and wednesday some okay. people want to camp out okay so we will keep people posted it's all dependent on weather and we've had some nice rain i guess it was sunday locally but everything's so localized here it's important that we keep looking our yeah. ground temperatures are still cool so we still have time if we got a big rain places even like uh, beaver creek might still be productive okay cool um all right cool and then i guess on that note um Alyssa, we talked about doing a foray regardless of weather. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I would love to. So we are planning an event on June 6th. Um, location is to be determined and is limited, of course, to members of the Pikes Peak Mycological Society. Um, this event is going to be great for newbies if you're new to the sport of, of mushroom hunting. We're going to um, be learning about the area, the terrain, the plants, the trees, what mushrooms like to grow where and why, maybe not why. Um, and we're also going to be doing a community cleanup event at the same time. So we're gonna be picking up trash and um, getting, getting prepared for the summer, letting the mushrooms grow without plastic, hindering them. And um, if you are a member of the club, you will get an email at some point that tells you the location. Um, in the meantime, you can go to signup.com. Actually, you'll get a link in an email for me, so you'll get an email soon. Um, that will have a link to the signup sheet. This is gonna be a limited event because of social distancing. We're going to meet in person, but we're going to be practicing social distancing and we're gonna be limited to groups of eight. So um, one board member will lead one group of eight and we have got three board members volunteered so far and a fourth one that hasn't been talked to yet, Brian. So we possibly have space for um, 32 people to join us. Um, make sure that if you sign up, that you're definitely gonna go. And remember, if you sign up your kids, everybody counts as one person, kids, husbands, everybody counts as one. So um, just make sure you're gonna come if you, if you sign up and we would love to have you and bring your trash bags and um, just look for that e that email to come soon with the link. And we're gonna wear masks, right? Yes, we're gonna wear masks. Masks are required. If you don't wear a mask, you can't come. Um, if you forget your mask, you have to go home. So definitely remember your mask. Yeah. We're gonna try this. Um, we wanna be out there. Outside's pretty safe, but uh, you know, if we're in a, outside with a group of people really close together for 30 minutes, that's unsafe. So we're gonna try to do it safely and still get out there this year. And this will be our first kind of attempt with, at that, see how it goes. So sign up, yeah. If, you, if you're feeling sick, don't come, stay home. All right, so yeah, expect a new, uh, an email about that in the next couple of days and we'll see what we get. Um, great, thanks Alyssa. Uh, Thank you. SC, anything from the newsletter you wanna remind people? Um, as always, just remember that if you are out there um, finding things, please um, send pictures uh, along with ID uh, to editor at Pikespeak, or sorry, what is it? Pikespeakmike.org. Um, <laughs> uh, and other, anything else, any other stories, any other cool mushroom projects, just always please send um, stories in. We would love to hear them. Recipes, anything really. Um, we, we always need content and Jesse and, um, and Mercedes work really hard to put the newsletter together every, every time. And uh, it's really nice to have other content in there from you guys. So excellent. When's, that, when's the next one coming out? For the next, for the June meeting. June meeting, it'll be out there before the June meeting. So excellent. 
All right. Um, any other news before we turn it over to Mercedes? One more thing. Yeah. If you want to become a member of Pikes Peak Mycological Society, you can visit our website at pikespeakmike.org slash join and sign up for membership. I mean, it's $30 for brand new members for a year and 25 if you're renewing. If you are a member, but you haven't yet renewed, please remember to do so. That's all. Thanks. I'll put a link right now in the um, in the Facebook or sorry, the YouTube link. Okay. Um, if you guys are watching live, also remember that you can ask questions while we while we go in the chat window of uh, of a, of the YouTube channel, uh, the YouTube live video. And then, um, yeah, please ask along the way. I'll be monitoring it, and I can uh, ask Mercedes and jump in here and there with questions, and make it more interactive because it is a little bit uh, surreal to be speaking at your computer. Um, okay, so. Tonight's lecture is titled High Desert Mushroom Cultivation and Other Fungal Pursuits. Uh, and before I turn it over to Mercedes, who's our presenter, I wanted to share uh, our recent mushroom haul from our garden. So it's been really dry and we haven't been, had a lot of luck out, uh, um, out in the field, but uh, we, we put in, uh, we got some um, wine caps growing in our garden along inside, uh, in mulch surrounding our garden beds that we we myceliated with, um, we actually bought a bag of myceliated grain from a Trad Cotter's company, Mushroom Mountain in South Carolina. But uh, there's lots of places you can get wine caps uh, spawn and it works really well. Uh, and it's pretty exciting, they're, they're massive. So wine caps are uh, Stropharia rugoso annulata, also known as wine caps, the garden giant, as you can see here, the king stropharia, they're delicious, they're big, and they fruit in the spring, and then again in the fall. And if you keep making sure they have moisture and mulch, and we just use the free mulch from the mulch, free mulch pile in uh, Colorado Springs, a mixed woods, mixed wood mulch, we don't even know what's in it really, but they grow very well. And we've had like baskets full every day. Uh, while they're popping. So they're beautiful mushrooms. And I just want to get everyone excited about the idea of actually mushrooms can grow <laughs> in Colorado. <laughs> I know it's been dry, but if you put them in your garden, and we're going to learn more about that right now, um, you could be having feasts every night of delicious mushrooms, even when the foraying is uh, not so great. So uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mercedes. Mercedes Perez Whitman is a permaculturalist, urban farmer, and citizen mycologist who practices earthworks in Colorado Springs. She's the founder of Myco Springs LLC, a mycologically focused business that's part of the Regenerative Landscaping Co-op Organa Gardens Cooperative. Her work is embedded in improving land health by cultivating native, climate-relevant, and drought-tolerant plants and fungi alongside land, environmental, and food justice advocacy. Mercedes has been a member of PPMS since 2016. And like we just said earlier, is the co-editor of our newsletter. So Mercedes, let's uh, take it away. Cool, thanks so much. Um, this is a pretty strange format. So let's try to make it like as interactive as possible. Um, ben, thank you very much for the introduction and for keeping track if there are any questions or comments as we go. Otherwise, I'm just gonna keep talking, I guess. So yeah, let's dive in. So yeah, Myco Springs right now um, is largely focusing on just like bulk spawn production and garden bed mushroom installations for people. Um, I also use it as Ben had mentioned, uh, to work as an independent contractor for Organic Gardens Cooperative. Um, and oftentimes I have the opportunity to implement some of these uh, fungi focused works on site, which is really fun. Um, and yeah, I'm a member of PPMS and Colorado Springs, or sorry, Colorado Myco Society. Um, and so as the title suggests, um, I'm concerned about cultivation in Colorado um, and how it can 
like kind of what we deal with here, how that can be used um, on a larger scale. Um, like a lot of like a lot of people, or a lot of people, including myself, uh, find can find it difficult to cultivate anything in Colorado, um, especially if you're coming from a different state or country, et cetera, with a very different climate. Um, and I've also become a lot more kind of aware of um, very kind of increasingly temperamental um, weather patterns in Colorado. Um, uh, we, we're, we deal with extreme heat, aridity, increasing aridity, altitude, intense temperature fluctuations, um, kind of random hail storms throughout the summer, um, and all kinds of challenges. Um, but I find it helpful to have a bit more of like a reflection relationship with those we're trying to cultivate um, and work with cultivars that are applicable to this climate and also help to develop our own via seed or spawn saving um, it's a, and work like that. Um, let's see, in this photo, my housemate Juniper and I are kind of converting our patchy uh, lawn of a hell strip um, into a garden bed, starting by sheet mulching, putting carbon, a carbon source on the, uh, onto the ground. And then in this case, we added a ton of mushroom spawn that we'd gotten for free. Um, and then mixed in some soil and topped with mulch. And um, it was just like a really kind of simple and effective way to um, work with this land that had been in, like incredibly dry, um, couldn't even really support grass. And now we have a bunch of plants planted in it. This is from last year around this time. Um, and so, yeah, as we, like it's not just Colorado that's seeing a lot of changes. Um, I think in the Southwest, uh, we do experience more serious, we are experiencing more serious certification. Um, and that's going to be more and more of a global issue. And so I think it can be really uh, helpful to like look at what one can do here to apply elsewhere as water becomes an increasingly uh, expensive and important resource. Um, okay. And then also I just want to spend like a little bit of time um, talking about like myths around around deserts or and the plains really um, as well. It has, the desert very much has a reputation of being unwelcoming um, and you know, even hostile. This is likely for US Americans, um, a result of settler colonialism thought where kind of conquering attitudes and you know, westward expansion um, led to encounters of you know, an environment that uh, settlers didn't understand or really try to and othered. Um, and I think the example of the phrase that one might hear a lot of food desert um, exemplifies this uh, general view. Um, so a food desert describes just uh, an area that where access to healthy and affordable food is incredibly limited. Um, people have also moved to food swamp instead. Um, and I find that any term that uses, um, uses, you know, words from like nature are going to be problematic in describing um, a, a problem that is very much human made and has to do with a very like intentional uh, inequity. And I think some like uh, phrases like food apartheid or food oppression do a lot better jobs of describing what the real issues are. So anyway, keeping that in mind, yeah, like uh, I think it's important to, to embrace where we are and work more reflexively with that in mind. Um, I'm also going to be talking, using some kind of permaculture 
Uh, terms, um, I do have a permaculture design certification and which has been really helpful for me in a lot of ways, but um, personally, I find permaculture more as like a tool than a life way or lifestyle for a lot of people. Um, but I think it can be a really useful tool and has good ideas um, and a very like helpful kind of underlying philosophy and means of practice in a that can be helpful when trying to work regeneratively in like this Western setting. Um, so these are just, I just kind of highlight a few um, terms that come up and uh, I think can just be nice to kind of shape the lens of, of where I'm coming from. And uh, again, just, remember to work with uh work with with what's with you and to not like other things and to use you know what what is in your in uh available to you to actually create surplus so okay um so starting the most important thing um, and starting to try to try and cultivate mushrooms. Also, I'm going to be largely talking about um, outdoor cultivation um, and like low and no tech uh, cultivation because um, one, it's just way more accessible. It's kind of in my world of earthworks um, and it's very cheap and like kind of the less uh, like sterile environment actually is going to be easier to cultivate in um, depending you know on what you're trying to grow so these are just some examples um, of what work here some people try to like i've known people who've, who've plugged a bunch of like shiitake mushrooms here and they just don't fruit at all or they fruit like a couple times and that's just like because shiitake mushrooms need more humidity and other factors that just aren't gonna do well here. So um, taking, using uh, strains that are, you know, climate relevant, or, you know, you can do your own wild culturing, which uh, a, mem a member of PPMS and friend, uh, Mike Williams cultivated the flamulina in the middle and um, the, Queen Shafaria on the right there was grown at Smokebrush Farm in Manitou Springs, just in a wood chip pile, same kind of deal as uh, Ben and Jesse's of like just mixed uh, free wood chips. Um, and then on the left, these are blue oysters um, that I used, that I grew and I'm growing from spawn just found um, after being fruited once or twice by a commercial um, mushroom company up in Denver, in the Denver area, which I'll come back to. So yeah, another really important part of, of permaculture is like observation and design. And um, these are just a couple examples from different sites that I've worked on um, where we're utilizing like what's already there um, on the, left side, um, there was already kind of a swell from runoff coming in from a parking lot right behind the, this photo um, at the Ivy Wild School. And so a coworker and I just like further dug out the swale. And then we ended up putting, it did kind of pool be, um, if it rained really hard because the soil is just so clay-like, but um, we put down spawn and uh, I actually, it, it didn't fruit that season and this ended up getting filled in, but the idea was that um, if we put down like spawn, a mix, a mix of spawn and wood chips um, where it pooled the most, that it would improve what's around it and also potentially fruit. Um, and then, yeah, just you, we have, like Ben had mentioned earlier, we have so many unique microclimates um, and it's really 
important to like use them or even help to create them a little more uh, like setting up systems um, like in this case on the right where we just started to terrace um, this hillside so that we could um, we could capture and we or and slow and spread the water uh, is the phrase that's often used um, and right now we're just filling that with agricultural waste and in the future we might start planting in that bed um, but by yeah bringing in the bringing in and capturing the moisture we're able to help break down that agricultural waste faster um, and start to like create really nice soil for things to go in in the future. Um, utilizing sh shady areas, especially for mushroom growing is really crucial. Um, and having, yeah, like trying to create an area with stable access to water is really helpful as well. So um, a lot of what, I like the, what these photos feature and what I've been working on um, just where I live right now is um, with the like massive amounts of um, spawn blocks that I've gotten for free from Front Range Fungi. They were in Castle Rock and now they're up in, in Commerce City. Um, and they like a bunch of other commercial grows uh, are you know, operating in a very like time specific capitalistic system where they need to fruit a certain amount. They're trying to be as consistent with how much they're fruiting and when um, to then sell to restaurants and other partners. And that means that they only really use like one, they only use a bag once or twice. Um, because after a couple of times the flush, the size of the flush is like decrease significantly enough for it to be at least on a, in a fine, this kind of financial lens, like more uh, sustainable to just have more blocks ready to fruit. Um, and that means that they had or have like just piles of, of these spent spent blocks um, hanging out just outside of their little trailers that they grow these mushrooms in. Um, so, and they are growing mainly oysters, shiitakes, um, and like chestnut mushrooms, I think, and king oysters. Um, I took shiitake blocks, um, or like kind of these elongated blocks that look like logs um, just for my feeding my compost, but otherwise um, I wasn't really trying to refruit them so much. So, and I focus mainly on oysters because they just are really easy to work with. Um, uh, have like very low risk of contamination, are uh, very flexible with the our crazy temperature fluctuations um, and the are able to grow off all different types of things. Um, I've mainly been experimenting with growing them off of coffee grounds, spent brewer's grain, wood chips, and straw, but you can even like use your weeds and like close another loop like that. I just personally haven't done that so much because I have animals I can feed my weeds to. Um, but yeah, so you can refruit these blocks. Um, you can also, like in that other photo of my housemate and I break them up um, and just add them kind of in a layer of when you're doing like sheet mulching or lasagna gardening, um, whatever you wanna call those kinds of techniques. Um, erosion control since, um, and that's something I've been experimenting with more um, on you know, hillsides where, where that are like very much bare or really don't have much uh, visible like plant and fungi matter. Um, so that when, and with our like extreme, being with the very extremely arid climate, that means that uh, erosion, if, and then getting these really intense rains means that we're really, these kinds of hillsides can be really prone to erosion. And so doing, I've been, experimenting with just putting down, uh, breaking up spawn and putting down wood chips and other carbon material 
they're going to hold and seeing how that can help to lock in more of the moisture when we do get it um, and cut down on just like tons of soil um, adding to runoff, et cetera. Um, I also have uh, buckets of worms. I experiment with vermicomposting and worms absolutely love um, getting spawn blocks. Um, oftentimes they're made of um, sawdust and like soybean hull. Um, and they just like, especially in combination with like coffee grounds, the worms absolutely love it. And my chickens and goats sometimes will eat them, will eat the blocks too even. Um, and I also break it up really finely and add it to potting soil. And it does occasionally fruit, as you can see on the left side. Um, what else? Also, oh, and on the right, I just put down spun uh, more as a soil builder, but these zucchini plants turned out to be, to form a really nice microclimate uh, for them and gave them a bunch of shade and um, therefore like, and with it being well mulched, it held in a lot of moisture and some ended up fruiting. Um, yeah, you could, I'm not really gonna, as I should have said at the beginning too also is like, I'm, yeah, I'm very much uh, not like a trained academic science person. <laughs> uh, a lot of what I do is more so intuitive and I can't really speak to a lot of things like what's on this chart, but I know that it's important to people. Um, and so I thought I would just put that up, but I, it's not generally kind of like the view that I um, have when, when thinking about fungi. So here's, and also a lot, yeah, so a lot of what I feel like I have to offer is just like empirical experiments um, that I've had the privilege of, of trying out. And so this is one really effective one. Um, and the idea in part came from visiting uh, Circle Acres uh, down in Aust uh, Austin, Texas, where Daniel Reyes of Michael Alliance um, is able to do some uh, remediation work there. It's an old brown site. Um, and anyway, when I was there, I saw that they were just straight up burying blocks uh, under mulch um, that they'd gotten from, yeah, also I think Hi-Fi um, is the name of the, the mushroom company. But yeah, just another commercial grow that um, ends up having this huge uh, just pile of, of spawn to play with. So in this case, um, this is at Quail Club where I live, where I picked, I started with a site. Um, I used this space like next to the house um, with a fence that, and so to the, let's see, so this is a street. So to the right of the fence is facing east. So for quite a bit of the day, this is, uh, remains in, in the shade. Um, yeah, the soil was really poor. It wasn't really just a, like a great place to try to put like a lot of different plants. Um, and it's also just to the left of it is a downspout, which um, will have a rain barrel connected to it. But right now, like the water can pretty easily flow into these beds. Um, so I just trenched I just dug out the dirt and put it somewhere else where I was making another bed. Um, and I lined it with newspaper. You could use cardboard too. This just creates like a buffer um, between the soil, which might have other potentially like competing bacteria and fungi. Um, and you know, what the fungi that we're trying, to, that's trying to be cultivated. And it also helps to retain moisture. Um, to feed the blocks more uh, water. So um, then we just, my housemates and I just filled these, uh, this trench with blocks and just uh, like tucked in some straw and 
wood chips in between them and then covered them. I had to lift, I used burlap just because I had it and um, the size worked really well, but they will like myceliate that. So you definitely have to like lift it every once in a while if you choose to like cover a mushroom patch with burlap. Um, and then soaked it really well initially. And then uh, soaked it less and less um, and just kind of kept an eye out and had ended up having like really substantial fruits, I think just a couple weeks after the installation. And yeah, on the right, you see fruits that are ready to harvest. And so this was all done around this time last year. And these beds are still going, though I am finding the fruits to be a bit smaller in some areas. Um, I'm also finding in some areas more than others, like a lot more worms and more kind of breaking down of the block. So I'm kind of experimenting with that, like adding more substrate um, potentially. Like I haven't really wanted to explore too much because I didn't really want to disrupt the mycelium, but um, I might end up just kind of seeing what's under there. And like, if it is pretty well composed, just using it, using that really like amazing um, beginnings of like a fungally dominant compost and placing it elsewhere um, and filling the rest back in with something else. I think that if you do, if you take blocks and you break them up and layer it with different carbon source materials, like maybe you'll continue to get more substantial fruits throughout. Um, but I, but it, then it would take longer for it to myceliate and start fruiting. So I'm still like experimenting with that. Um, so, so I just want to check in. I guess we're good if I haven't heard from Ben. So no questions yet, Mercedes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, closing loops, as I touched on earlier, um, there are a lot of opportunities for using uh, materials from our urban waste stream, really just general like capitalistic waste stream um, that are deemed as, you know, like just undervalued byproducts of whatever industry that we're talking about. And so that means looking at, um, in this case, like in Colorado, we have a lot of cannabis growing or hem and hemp growing um, and craft beer. And so I know that Front Range Fungi had started to experiment with using hemp seed hull with a local hemp grow. Um, and we're getting pretty good results though in comparison to the soybean hull. The, I think the fruits were a bit smaller because of the size of this material. And so it was a little bit bigger, which meant um, it couldn't absorb as much moisture and therefore it couldn't, wouldn't fruit as much. That was at least in their preliminary stages. Um, I don't know if they've worked on that more, honestly. But spent brewer's grain can be found um, outside of a lot of breweries. Um, you can just call them and uh, ask them or like, there's also, um, so there, there are also just areas like, you know, by their, by their dumpsters that you might find um, like bags or um, trash bins filled with them. So I've used a bunch of brewer's grain from Phantom Canyon, which is just really convenient because uh, I live just right outside of downtown Colorado Springs. Um, I've also, when I live near Storybook Brewing, I would, um, I had a relationship with them and just dropped off five gals, five gallon buckets of of grain that then they would use, um, that then they would fill and I would just pick up. Um, and I've also gone to different coffee shops uh, around town and collected, um, and collected uh, 
their their spent their used grounds um and so and yeah i mean all of this is like very much free i did have the like the privilege of having a car to be able to pick up and haul all of these materials um and I also, oh, I have a relationship with someone at uh, Aspland uh, Tree Service, Tree Services, um, and I've been able to call them uh, to drop off wood chips after work um, sometimes, and that's been really great. Um, I've never utilized like the wood shavings from a furniture shop, but that would be cool. I know people who do that. Um, and yeah, so just to say that you know, different kinds of foods for mushrooms can be really accessible, but again, it depends on what kinds of mushrooms you're trying to grow. And that's like in part why my experience are done so much with oysters because I can use, they, they're just so flexible. Um, and yeah, as you can see, oh yeah. And then um, also, you know, getting spawn doesn't necessarily take like a connection like a commercial grow. Um, you can do what's called like a, the burrito tech, like in this photo on the left here, where um, you literally just take like the, the butts or the, and the stems of uh, a mushroom and you just like break it up into little pieces and and you put it you put it on some cardboard that then you roll up and then you can put um in a ziploc bag or it doesn't you could use a reusable vessel as well um and kind of just like set it and forget it and hopefully you remember at some point and you find uh it myceliated which then you can take this and break it up and add it to um more substrate Hey, Mercedes, we do have a question. Are you ready? Uh, uh, yes. Cool. Also, you're, you're, this WhatsApp group, I need to stop looking at my phone. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, Trent from Modern Forager has a question. Cool. Um, he says, uh, we have straw bales for gardening. Some are one year old and some from this year. Any suggestions for mushrooms to try other than wine caps? I tried oysters last year and they didn't do well. I bored holes in them and implanted with grain spawn. No mushrooms, but lots of mice. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> huh. That's really, I'm surprised that oysters didn't work. Um, huh. Or wine caps. I'm semi stumped. Well, you maybe you could use it for agaricus or something. Yeah, an agar yeah, an agaricus would would enjoy that. Um, I know um, a grassipi <laughs> showed up on my my wood chips from probably the free mulch pile. I mean, you don't eat them, but uh, they they did very well in uh, old hay because we had some old hay back there. Uh -huh. They were popping like crazy, but I did not try to plant them and I did not eat them. <laughs> right. Yeah, I've had some like different inky caps come up. Yeah. Um, so yep. maybe exploring that could be helpful. Brian, were you going to say something? Yes, um, that was really good information. If somebody did get a Garricus patch started, what you said when you talked about, if you have the mycelium going, you can move it to other places and use it. And that's really great info. And I'm sure it happened with the Garricus or Shaggy Mane or other things that like spent straw. Yeah, Shaggy Mane could be, could be a really cool one. That's, that is a, a mushroom I'd love to experiment cultivating with more. Um, so yeah, I wish I could say more exactly, but hopefully that's helpful. All right, so there's a lot of, a lot of, there are a lot of ways to, you know, spread the mycelial web and, um, 
change the very prevalent mycophobia in the US and elsewhere. Um, and so a lot like what a lot of what I care to do is just like show people that um, especially like like other you know other people and enthusiastic about permaculture um because like and and exploring well yeah just a lot and and just plant people is just like showing them that mushrooms aren't scary to and aren't scary to grow and to identify and to eat if edible <laughs> um if that's what you're trying to do and like um so there are just a couple photo examples of like on the on the left side is just my friends at a birthday party um planting day adding uh some of these spawn blocks to these raised beds i did learn later that some of them fruited which is pretty cool especially because this gets mainly full sun um and then on the right is my housemates and I working on that front bed. Um, and I think just like, yeah, definitely a really effective way of like getting people interested is just like, is doing little things like this with them. Um, and also giving them some edible mushrooms that you grew. So yeah, just day-to-day -day things, forays, whether like, you know, formally with a club or not, as long as you know what you're doing or you know you go out and you just identify you try to identify things etc um yeah let's see where am i in time and then this is this like slide of off-season work is like applicable you know if you're trying to if you're focusing on um working with with mushrooms outdoors um which is you know mainly what i'm what i've been doing um and also i have a pretty seasonal like main job so the, these are just some things i've done like growing cordyceps inside um and doing more like lab work so this photo on the right is um uh a little lab that Wes Cooper and myself built, mainly him really, uh, built at my last uh, living situation in our garage, in my garage. And um, it was really like cool and effective. It's just, you know, we are using plastic, but we created walls and, and by just putting up these two by fours and stapling and the plastic. And then he made this little zipper door and it was really fun. Um, and then there are also, yeah, if you are doing more like indoor gr growing, there are, if you're trying to sell mushrooms, there are like winter markets available. Um, and some more just kind of ways of collaborating. Um, so I touched upon, you know, just like family and friend involvement. Um, uh, sharing and using yeah what you have and just sharing it if you can so these are just a couple examples um on the right is a permaculture action day at seeds of power unity farm in denver um and we line some of the um beds and pathways that were full of mulch with with spawn i don't know if any have fruited but i'm sure it was helpful in some capacity um also being real like you know selling the surplus when you can so uh that on the right is me at sharing a table with a really amazing local company microgreens company called eternal bloom based in pueblo west um at the colorado farm and arts market last season um and we had a really nice deal where because I'm not really growing I don't really want to be I can't I can't really spend the time like trying to um grow a certain amount of mushrooms for like to like have some sort of restaurant partnership or even or like any more kind of consistent partnership is not really like of interest to me right now just given my circumstances 
Um, so this was a really amazing way just to be able to bring what I had and share a table with someone and like throw them a few dollars for the, for the table um, while not and making and but and also making some money but not uh, being so committed to having a lot of mushrooms all the time though I ended up I ended up having like quite a bit um, which was fun but yeah and then future work so there's just a lot of potential for further collaboration with other small businesses um, there's also soil cycle which is a social enterprise of Colorado Springs food rescue that does um, that collects compost um, from from homes and I think some businesses as well um, we're hoping to work together to sell people spawn um, jar, just like jars of spawn um, and encouraging them to add a bit to start their own vessel um, maybe like a single you know so a single use plastic vessel that was gonna get recycled and like saving that and putting in your coffee grounds and then like a little bit of the this will be oyster spawn and just layering it so that you're creating your own little mushroom kit that then you can fruit from you can add it back to the you know your compost bucket um if you have anywhere you know if you have a garden bed to put it in you can do whatever with it um uh but it'd just be i think a fun and simple and effective just like way of introducing uh fungi into more uh everyday settings um and we'll see what else we come up with um fungally dominated compost systems are something i'm really interested in especially with just like how much wood-based detritus i come upon uh in landscaping work um and so having a fungally dominated compost that is um able to break down more of these woody materials that you know like a hot compost might not do as well and that you just wouldn't want to introduce into your hot compost anyway is really cool that would is a longer time commitment um but it's really cool because you can really just kind of set and forget that um so yeah we'll see and then if I yeah there are a lot of opportunities that I personally haven't had like the capacity for but things that people can do is partnering with like a CSA um, and other cool ways of, of um, yeah, just like getting mushrooms into the scene, especially into the like, uh, into these already established like food uh, conscious scenes. Um, Cause I think in a lot of like circles that I've been in, it's still, it's still pretty like scary. So yeah, I'm gonna, that's really it. <laughs> uh, people can contact me. My Myco Springs account on Instagram isn't uh, very um, well like posted on just yet, but it's there. And then I post a lot of stuff just on my personal account too, which is Mersalad and people can email me. I'll have a Myco Springs email at some point. Um, and yeah, that's it. Great. Thanks, Mercedes. Um, a, lot of, a lot of good information. I wanted to really uncomfortable not being able to see people. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. <laughs> it, it's wonderful. Um, I uh, just wanted to say that there's a great book um, by Trad Cotter. That's a good resource. I'm holding it up, but we have a link on hey. our yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on our resources page on our on pikespeakmike.org. It's called Organic Mushroom Farming and Mycoremediation by Trad Cotter. And Trad and Olga Cotter also have a company called Mushroom Mountain, which is where I bought the spawn for our wine caps. You can buy lots of different stuff from them, they ship it to you, you can try to grow it 
either indoors or outdoors, depending on what you buy. Um, and then they have a little booklet that you can buy, or they can send you a free PDF of kind of <coughs> way, you know, uh, recommendations on how to put them outside or, or different ways of growing. So if you wanted to like just start maybe simply and try some stuff out, that would be a really good resource. But um, yeah, do you have any other suggestions, Mercedes? I do. Um, and I, yeah, thank you. Cause I had these right next to me and almost forgot, but um, there's also the DIY mushroom cultivation book, growing mushrooms at home for food, medicine and soil by uh, my pal Willoughby Arvalo, who I got to meet at New Moon Mycology Summit in uh, the Adirondacks in New York, which is also where I did a version of this presentation. And then I also got to meet uh, Mario Ceballos from the San Diego area, who um, is part of the P POC fungi community. And they've been making zines. Um, and they also, if you sign up for their mailing list, you can um, get these in PDF form. And they're really incredible and very much um, aligned with like, very much view uh, mycology as something to be um, decolonized and decentralized. Um, and so the, yeah, this is the first one and um, they're, and so yeah, such a, what, what they're all about is making mycology more accessible to uh, specifically um, black and indigenous people of color, um, but you know, and um, also queer and trans people of color and uh, they are just really doing some cool stuff and you can also follow them on some social media. So yeah, I think those are, those are what I got. Awesome. Um, I'm just checking the, the chat here. David's saying he's only getting audio on YouTube. Um, if anyone's only getting audio on YouTube, uh, sorry about that, but, uh, Fortunately, the video will be posted after the fact, like right after this, it'll be go to our videos page and then you'll be able to watch it later um, if you weren't able to watch it live or if you're having technical issues. Um, any other questions out there? Thanks, Mercedes. This is great. Do you want to just end screen share real quick so that I can get yes. the videos, or videos? Thank you. And thanks anyone who's been watching. How do I unshare? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Got it. Maybe. Down in the bottom. Yeah, I think you got it. Okay. There's Brian. <laughs> cool. Going back to gallery view here. Everybody's on. Um, great. So, uh, I don't see any other questions, but that was good. I, I guess um, you mentioned with the, you know, burrito method, um, it works really well with just even store-bought mushrooms. Uh, yeah. You can take oyster cutoffs from your oysters that you, oyster mushrooms you buy in the store. And we've done, we've successfully gotten mycelium in a bag. We have not successfully gotten it to fruit outside yet. We'll see, but that's a really easy method. Uh, can you describe that again for people or like just the whole step-by-step -step of that? Yeah, you, you just take the, the stems of said mushroom and you put it on what's been soaked uh, cardboard strips, um, like corrugated cardboard. You can like, you know, take, thin out a bit um, and you'll just set little shreds of the, um, the stems onto the cardboard and then you just roll it, roll them up like a burrito. And like, you can layer it more, you know, you can do like multiple cardboard and stem uh, rolls and put that in, yeah, something like a Ziploc bag or, or jar, just ensure that there's some air exchange that can happen uh, and, you know, uh, less, a small, 
and you want to lessen like the risk of contamination so like you could even put like polyfill like in just the corner of the ziploc bag or whatever so yeah it's easy yeah um danny has a question what's your favorite mushroom <laughs> i don't know i guess i i pick this a lot just because i think it's so underrated um and i really truly love albatross confluence i love how seafoody it is it's also just like really beautiful the way that it grows oftentimes like popping out of moss um and it's often growing around porcini season as well so and in the same same areas so um I am an advocate for the albatrellis. <laughs> um, checking again. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess one thing just to note, I mentioned it, uh, mentioned it earlier, but you know, we planted oysters and wine caps in our mulch, but then the mulch, we don't know what trees that's coming from or where that's coming from. And then all sorts of other stuff can pop up. So even if you planted wine caps in your mulch, there's a possibility that what's growing out of your mulch is not wine caps. So you still want to be careful with your identification. I mean, oysters are pretty easy, but mm -hmm. other mushrooms, you know, still pay attention to what you're, I got very excited uh, when I saw little, little, little caps popping out of the mulch. I was like, ah, and then the next day I went out there and it's like, wait, but they're, they're fully kind of developed now. They opened up and what, is going on these aren't, these aren't wine caps they're tiny you know they're not wine red at all but then also the other thing is wine caps generally have a wine red cap but in our yard we get a lot of sun where the soil where the mulch is and it bleaches out the caps pretty much always so just from cap color alone you can't identify them um and if you only saw a picture of the cap you'd say these aren't wine caps but you have to look at all of them you know mm -hmm. underneath the spores or this uh, you know the gill color and and everything else to understand, you know, we know what they are because we've had them growing and we've, we've you know, paying attention. But but if you saw them in 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 the wild, you might not immediately identify them because the sun can do crazy things to your mushrooms. Right. Yeah. And also, um, I'm just looking at Trent's like question again, and um, I just want to voice that using green spawn outside can definitely attract um creatures like mice and you might also get some like i i'm assuming it's like raccoons and maybe skunks that will maybe like uh tear up the patch a little bit but for me it's never been that significant and um i think maybe burying like just making sure there's a pretty good layer of mulch on top can really help uh with that issue but they definitely like the like sweet grain um like rodents and other creatures so something definitely to keep in mind and maybe experiment with more I had, something, I had something last year digging up all my wine caps uh really? i had to get make chicken cage chicken wire cages to put over them when, once i saw them because I think it was a raccoon just going in, just like digging them up. But that was the first year we put them in. So maybe they were after the grain. This year hasn't been such a big problem. Mm, yeah, they might have spread more onto the wood chips. So yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Any other? I don't see any other questions. Um, any other comments, Alyssa or Brian? experiment and develop stuff right here for Colorado just like the herisium that we started I know that's going to go out and do something uh, the wine caps are great uh, that's good information that when you have wood chip piles there's some dangerous mushrooms that grow on wood fortunately none of them look like a big garden king and so you're not probably going to confuse a gallerina with a garden king then you're probably confuse a lepiota with a garden king and those are the two that could show up in my wood chips on any given year right yeah definitely important to 
highlight that and yeah know what you're growing um and yes i i should add herisium to the slideshow uh herisium coralloides is grows natively here and brian has um showed me how well they can they can they can do in outdoor situations here um in garden situations so that's really exciting um and oh what, what do we have there this is the herisium that you came over to my house and inoculated and i want to report back to everybody that you have percent um good culture hey thank you <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, cool. that's six. I think if we're good, if we're done, uh, no more questions. I think we can say good night. Um, I just want one thing. Um, thanks again, Mercedes. This was great. And yep. um, if you guys start, you know, start it now. And then in the fall, you might get something. In the spring, you might get something. If you keep adding wood chips, you can keep them going. Um, our next meeting will be June 24th. Likely, we will be doing another remote meeting well who knows but um it really depends on safety and uh right now our, our meeting spot is the bear creek nature center and and i'm waiting I, you know every month i check in and we see what their how their you know what their regulations are what what rules they're following this month it was 10 people or less so we thought that wouldn't be a fun meeting um so we'll see next next month what's what happens but um we are still uh, everything we're kind of just like figuring it out as we go along. We have a few speakers we're contacting potentially for June and, and July and September and August. And so I, we will keep you posted via email and on Facebook and on the website um, with what's happening next, but mark your calendars for June 24th at six o'clock. We'll either be on YouTube again like this or at the Bear Creek Nature Center in person. We'll see. And then keep, tuned if you're a member um you'll get an email from Alyssa soon about uh, a foray and then and any other forays that happen this year you'll get an email and if you're not a member um the only thing that is members only is forays so our meetings are always open to the public but forays are members only so i did post a link in the youtube chat uh you can join on via paypal pay through paypal on our website it's not very expensive and as soon as you're a member you're on the email list to get information on 4As. I'll send out that email tonight for everybody so you can expect it by the morning. All right. Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mercedes. Right. Thanks, Mercedes. Great job. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. And Good then, uh, everyone, we'll just uh, keep an eye on the moisture and we'll find mushrooms soon. And <laughs> see you June 6th, everyone. All right. June 6th. Bye. Bye bye.